Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here to talk about uh, uh, my book, The American Covenant. Uh, the, the reason I, I began writing this book and researching for this book, it began about 10 years ago while I was, uh, I had just uh, taken employment at the CIA, and for the first time I was standing at the Washington, D.C. Mall, and I, I approached the Lincoln Memorial. And as I walked up there, I don't know if, how many of you have been there, uh, I had a very, what was for me a spiritual experience as I, as I walked and saw this, this magnificent building, and, and I felt very, uh, I felt a strong manifestation to me that, that Lincoln and the Founding Fathers were, were very, very spiritual people and, 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 and knew things, and they had at this point accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ even, and, and I wanted to know more, and so I began digging. And where I began was, because my emphasis was kind of foreign policy, I, I was always fascinated with this connection of, of how the United States, uh, where there's oppression and tyranny, the United States usually finds itself there in some way or another, whether it's diplomacy or example or war if necessary. And when they pull out and leave, there's, there's temples start sprouting up in those lands um, because they bring constitutional principles, holy principles. And uh, it was, it's connected to a prophecy that... Uh, in Isaiah chapter 2, which talks about the law will go forth out of Zion. And, and uh, Harold B. Lee and others have confirmed that, that that's talking about constitutional law being exported. Elder Oaks talked recently and has several times talked about the great, uh, the great export of, of America is the constitutional principles that allow for the gospel and for the restoration to, to thrive everywhere. And so I focused my, my efforts in, in, in that area. And um, in my own job, I see the example. I, I see illustrations of of, of uh, the law going forth out of Zion. That's significant, and, and it, it all comes back to that prophecy and to, the, to a covenant, uh, a country with a divine mission. So I want to focus on this, and, and I began my research thinking I need to talk a little bit about the founding of America. How was this covenant established? What, where, you know, where, did, where did it come out? Where did it break forth? And I thought I'd dedicate a couple chapters to that. Well, that, those couple chapters have turned into basically two volumes about that part of the covenant, and I've yet to get to the foreign policy part, which I hope will, will be done some point in the future. And so what we have is basically the founding and, and what happened here at home in, in the establishment of this covenant. In 1776, George Washington, with his ill-prepared group of colonists, entered New York because the British were coming. And the British were coming with the largest fleet that had ever, to that point in history, been crossed, had, had crossed an ocean in preparation for battle. Now, this is a modern landscape setting of, of uh, New York. This is Manhattan Island. This is Long Island. New Jersey over here. Here's the Hudson. Here's the mile-long East River. Washington and his men were headquartered. His headquarters were here in Manhattan. They crossed the, the mile-long East River, and they met the British on Long Island down here, and that was the first battle. And the colonists got absolutely routed. Okay, it was an absolute routing, and, and the, the British knew this was going to be over. This whole revolution was done before it began. And they knew they were, were going to be successful because as, as Washington's men tried to run back to safety and get out of here, they're going to go to New Jersey and head out, head out of there. The British fleet was heading up the East River. They were going to cut them off at the pass here. And the British land soldiers were here, and they were going to just trap them right here. And the cause would have been over. The revolution would have been over in 1776. But do you know what happened? He tried something very daring. He thought, I'm going to outrun them. I'm just going to, we're going to evacuate 20,000 men, horses, cannon, guns. We're going to outrun them. We're going to cross the river and get out of here. Well, the problem was, is that how are they going to beat the, 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 the British Navy from coming up here? And then these guys, they were here, they're going to trap them. Well, nighttime came, and they, they settled down, the, the British settled down to camp, figuring we'll get them in the morning, and the British fleet, were gonna, they were coming up anyway. Well, the British fleet couldn't make it up, because all of a sudden, this profound wind pushes back, and this the, the most powerful navy can't make it up this East River. So Washington makes his, his daring escape by the, you know, at the cover of night, but the sun's coming up, and once the sun comes up, it's going to expose his scheme. The British down here will see it, and they'll come in. Well, right as the sun comes up, a pea fog soup drops down right over this area. This is all primary sources. I'm not making any of this up. David McCullough talks about it. This is, this is very, this is very uh, real, what I'm talking about. Everything I'm going to talk to you about is real, primary source. I'm very, very anal when it comes to my research. I don't make stuff up. You're going to think some things I'm going to show you, you're going to think I made it up. But I promise you I haven't. Okay? Po a fog pea soup hits this river. They make their escape, and they, and they get out of there. The British 
Washington's the last man to cross. Right as he crosses, it's lifted. They see the British with their hands up like this, going, what on earth just happened? And the British, and the, and the, the British boats are still down here. They still can't get up. Oh, by the way, the, the, the wind shifted in the middle of the night and, and went eastward, too, to help Washington's men get across. Okay? So they escape, and so on and so forth. I could continue on and on and on about these miracles. They continue through the eight years of war. Absolutely fascinating. The part, and you can read that in history books. The part you won't read in history books is the American Covenant. Right before this miracle happened, George Washington issued this general order to his people, to his men. He said, instant to be observed today as a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer, humbly to supplicate the mercy of Almighty God, that it would please him to pardon all our manifold sins and transgressions and to prosper the arms of the United Colonies and finally establish peace and freedom of America upon a solid and lasting foundation. So that, quote, the fate of unborn millions will now depend under God on the courage and conduct of this army. Let us therefore rely upon the goodness of the cause and the aid of the supreme being in whose hands victory is. And he says this, continues, we must, quote, endeavor to check our behavior and reflect that we can have little hopes of the blessings of heaven on our arms if we insult, if we insult it by the impiety of, and folly. Okay, surely God will not, and, and okay, he sounds, a, he sounds a lot here like Captain Moroni, doesn't he? Captain Moroni said the same things to his people because it's the same covenant. Captain Moroni said, surely God should not suffer that we who take upon the name of Christ shall be trodden down and destroyed until we bring it upon ourselves by our own transgressions. Now, I could go on and on, but before every single one of these miracles, George Washington issued the covenant again and again. It's almost absurd how many times he did it. And what's even more absurd is how often it's not placed in our history books. He knew there was a covenant. Now, here's the a, here's a great crossing. This covenant begins long before America. We have to go back to the pre-mortal existence. And we need to know something about who our enemy is. Because there's an enemy to the plan of salvation, and we know that's Lucifer. Lucifer had a plan. His plan promised us some kind of salvation. What was that salvation, though? His plan was, was one without agency, without freedom. We're robots just doing what he says. Is there exaltation under that plan? Can you possibly progress if you don't have the freedom to choose and to longingly make covenants and to longingly grow, to be able to fall on your face and pick yourself back up? Can you grow? No. He knew that. He knows it today. So he attacks agency. He doesn't want us to, he, he wants our salvation to be something where we're down here and he's up here. He doesn't want us to progress into exaltation. And so his plan was a plan without agency. And there is a reason that he is now here on the earth and he has made us another promise. And he told us that he will buy up armies and he will buy up navies and he will rule with blood and horror. He's made that promise. It's the same plan from the, pre, from the premortal existence. It's the same plan. He wants to buy up armies and navies and crush agency. And if he can do that, he can keep us from progressing. He can keep gospel principles out of the hands of God's children. And we have seen him do that. Has he not bought up armies and navies? Just look around. And has he not reigned with blood and horror? Of course he has. And so does it to, for God to respond to this, does he not need a physical response? These are real armies and navies here. He needs a physical response to take out that threat. And this is where national covenants come in. This is where the American covenants come, come in, comes in. The Old Testament talks about the Hebrews having this national covenant. And we need to distinguish between our national covenants and our priesthood covenants. Our national covenants deal with blessings that we don't see in temple covenants or baptismal covenants. They're, they're, they're blessings such as liberty, liberty from, from tyrants, protection from evil, from physical evils, and prosperity, wealth that nations give, a land with milk and honey. Because wealth is, is, is necessary in order to guarantee protection and freedoms to, 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 be able to, to be able to thrive. These aren't things we get in, the temple, in our temple covenants. These are part of a national covenant. We need to distinguish that. The Book of Mormon is clear, if we know what we're looking for, between the national covenant and then the priesthood covenants, which are more important, and they rest up on that foundation. The American covenant is the national covenant. And it's so significant that it was discussed all the way back in the days when, when Israel was being established. Jacob, this grandson of Abraham, who carried the Abrahamic covenant with him, um, the Abrahamic covenant is humongous, and it includes a lot of things, including national covenants. Jacob blesses Joseph, his son Joseph. Have you heard of the land of Joseph? 
land of Joseph is America. Joseph Smith talked about this. And he, he put his hand on Jacob, and this is in Genesis 49. This is very significant. In Genesis 49, and this is from your seminary manuals, it says that, that his posterity will inherit a land, a land over the wall, which is the ocean. Okay? And that this land will be a land, if you read the entire promise, the entire blessing, it's a land of protection. They'll be protected from the archers who will seek to seek their lives. And they'll be protected by the, by the, by the, uh, the hand of the God of Jacob, it says. And that it'll be a, pros- a prosperous land. And it talks about the chief things of the, of the hills and that it'll be a prospering people. And there's a, a section in there that talks about liberty. Joseph Smith, in, in his translation of that particular blessing, talks specifically about the liberty of this land. So this land will be inherited by Joseph's seed. Joseph had two sons. We know this, Ephraim and Manasseh. They were to be carriers of this promise, of this American covenant. This American covenant was going to be so significant that it would be played out at least two different times. Okay? One time through Manasseh and one time through Ephraim. But where do we see the fulfillment of these blessings? The rest of the Bible tells us about Judah's blessings, that the Messiah will come out of his line and the the great blessing that went to Judah. But what about Joseph? We know that Ezekiel talked about another book that will come forth, that will 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 be a companion to the book of Judah, which is the Bible. And we know through the light of the gospel that that book is the Book of Mormon. It fulfills Joseph's promises. And so we should see in the Book of Mormon, in Joseph's, in the stick of Joseph, that Ezekiel talks about, we should see the fulfillment of these, aw- these awesome blessings of a people stemming from Joseph, crossing the Great Wall, and inheriting a land of liberty, protection, and prosperity where the gospel of Jesus Christ can find a safe haven, can flourish. And of course we see it. We read the Book of Mormon, ac- Mormon account. How many times does Lehi say who he's from? Is, he, is that important to him that he's from Joseph? He says it a hundred times. Right? Even when he tells his sons to go back to Laban and get the plates, he says to them, you got to go back because that's our genealogy. We are, we, are, we are heirs to those blessings, the blessings of the American covenant. Go back and get that. We need to show who we are. And he also said, I'm from Manasseh. He said that at least two times in the account. He's from, so this was Manasseh. This was Manasseh's time. Now, um, references to Ephraim in the Book of Mormon, almost every time when you look at it, it's, re- it's referring to some future time. Though, though uh, Ishmael, Father Ishmael was Ephraim as well. Now, something significant here. When, he, when Lehi shows up on the shores, they get out, they fall on the ground, they kiss the ground. This is an important account that you'll get into in a minute here. And before he starts building temples and churches and organizing the kingdom of God in that way, he establishes, based on Genesis 49, he establishes the American covenant first. He says this is a land of liberty, protection, and prosperity. Keep the commandments prosper in the land, okay? He he establishes that first, and then come the more important priesthood covenants, okay? Well, the national covenant fails. The people let him down. The people sinned against the covenant. The prophets fell apart. The church fell apart. And so the account account goes in here, goes into the ground for another people to come. I love this picture, okay? This is a transfer. To me, it's it's a covenant transfer, Okay, because you have Manasseh, and he's giving this covenant over to Ephraim. We know Joseph Smith is Ephraim. Um, I like it, but I also don't like it, because the covenant transfer didn't start in 1820. It didn't start in 1830. The covenant transfer started long before that with the establishment of, or the reestablishment of, this American covenant. We know where Manasseh went. We can follow Manasseh across the Atlantic and, uh, and, and, and over to the New World. Well, what about Ephraim? If Ephraim was also to be an heir of this American covenant issued by Jacob, where did Ephraim go? Well, I can't get into it. I don't have time. But there's lots of scriptural and historical evidence that tell us that large parts of the blood of Ephraim went to Western Europe. And from Western Europe, the Lord then selected those people and brought them across the Atlantic. Now, this is just a repeat of what happened with Lehi and Nephi. They crossed over, and the blessing was now in effect again. The American covenant was now in effect again. And here's where some fascinating things start happening. Here's, an, here's a depiction of them on their boat and the pilgrims crossing over. And what did they say as they were crossing over? What did they do when they came to the land? The account of the pilgrims landing at the New World 
is, is basically just a verbatim account of when the Jaredites landed. They land, they hit their knees, they kiss the ground, and they make a covenant with God. Now, John Winthrop, John Winthrop, one of the leaders of this group, he, you would swear on your life that he was holding a Book of Mormon in his hand when he established the American covenant here in this land. He almost copied what Lehi said. He said, liberty, protection, prosperity, obey God's commandments, and we will prosper in the land. He, they knew who they were, and guess what else they said about themselves? They said, we are the new Israel. They said that a hundred times. They, they're, they're, they, the Puritans named their, their land Salem. Where that, where, that, where that derived out of? They knew they were the new Israel. Uh, Samuel Sewell, one of the Puritans, he said that he recognized that the natives that they were in, they're mingling with, they were the lost tribes of Israel. And he was trying to bring them together, and he wanted to have a, a build the kingdom of God together with him. He didn't have a lot of followers in, in, in that idea, okay? But he believed that. Now, here's the question you're going to ask. Well, if, if, the, if the stick of Joseph is to... Be a, is, 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 is basically a manifestation of the American covenant, how come the stick of Joseph only tells us the story of Manasseh? We only get Manasseh's side. Are you sure Ephraim was part of this? Are you sure this, there was really a second founding of the American covenant? Because the stick of Joseph only tells us one side, only Manasseh's side. And the answer to that is that, no, it doesn't. <laughs> the Book of Mormon also tells of the second founding. We read 1 Nephi 13, and do we even realize why we're reading that? The entire chapter of 1 Nephi 13 is an, a vision that Nephi is having of the second founding. What does he see? He sees Columbus. He sees the pilgrims bringing the Bible, the covenant across. He sees um, the Revolutionary War. He sees the, he sees the war. Uh, he sees um, the restoration on the back of that revolution, standing and the new books being restored. They see it. What did Jesus Christ say as a resurrected being standing amongst the Nephites? He said... This land will, at some point in the future, he's talking about the future, this land will be established by the Father, and it will be established in freedom by the Father. He talked about the second coming around of this American covenant. And there's uh, many other places in the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon truly is an account of both Manasseh's fulfillment and Ephraim's fulfillment. Now, another question you're having right now, you, perhaps, you're saying, well, Tim, when they talk about the, the newcomers, the Latter-day Americans, they call them Gentiles again and again. So how can you say, how can you say they're part of the seed of, of, of Joseph and, and Jacob? And the answer to that is go look in your Bible dictionary about what Gentile means in a Book of Mormon context. Go, go look at it. It's very clear. It says that it's people that come from nations that don't have the gospel, not people that don't have the blood of Israel in them. In fact, they, they, they did have the blood of Israel in them. They, just, they hailed from nations without the gospel. I don't get confused by that. Awesome imagery here. Okay, illustrations, examples. When, when Ephraim hits the shores, who's there to save and help him? His brother from the past, Manasseh, is there. This is Squanto. <laughs> Squanto showed up and saved the pilgrims. They would have all died. Historians agree they would have all died. They had no idea what they were doing when they landed here. But Squanto knew what he was doing. And Squanto taught them how to hunt, how to fish, and save them. Half of them died as it was. Okay, but Squanto saved the other half. Squanto shows up in the camp one day at the, at the plantations, just shows up, and he speaks perfect English. That's not a coincidence either. Okay, and he teaches them what they need to know. So this great kind of, again, this, this whole idea of the, the covenant transfer between Ephraim and Manasseh, just fascinating. So now we get into the revolutionary period. I gave you one example of, of, of Washington's miracle, his miraculous escape. And I wish I had time to get into all the miracles because there's so many. Um, but some that are really interesting, uh, angels, Depicted angels in the camp of Washington. Did you know that Orson Hyde said that Moroni, the prince guardian of America, he said this in general conference, an apostle of God, that Moroni was in the camps of Washington. And did you further know that there's an independent account of a visitation, an angelic visitation to Washington in the camps, in his camps. There's also uh, stories about Washington. Now, if some are anecdotal, and, I, and if they are anecdotal, I give you what evidence there, there exists, okay? I'm very honest about it. But there are interesting accounts of Washington seeking baptism by immersion, feeling inclined towards that ordinance, and several other miracles. Um, now, one of the most amazing underreported events in American history is when George Washington, after winning the revolution, becomes the first president of the United States. The Constitution has been created. The Constitution is nothing but an embodiment of the American covenant. 
It's, it's, it's Genesis 49 written in political terms. How do we get the blessings of liberty, protection, and prosperity under God? Okay. Um, Washington, per this constitution, he stands there. He puts his hand on the Bible. He raises his arm to the square. Let's not, let's not undervalue the significance of what he was doing there. He was taking the American covenant, and he promised to um, uphold it. And he gave a speech before doing this in which he once again invokes the American covenant. I'm not going to, I don't have time to read the entire thing, but he, se- he tells the people, it's an invocation of the American covenant. He says that it would be improper for me to omit in this first official act my fervent supplications to that almighty being who rules over the universe, who presides in the councils of nations, and whose providential aids can supply every human defect. That, that his benediction may consecrate to the liberties and happiness of the people of the United States. And he says, we ought to be no less persuaded that the smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right, which heaven itself has ordained. He invoked the American covenant again and again, and our historians don't want to recognize this, but he did. Now, here's the other part that the historians can't even recognize it if they wanted to, okay? When George Washington took his oath of office, armed to the square, hand on the Bible, historians to this day marvel at why he just openly opened the Bible at random. For such a symbolic person as Washington was, why didn't he pick his favorite scripture? Because every other other president seems to do that. Why didn't Washington do it? Because it's just a bunch of gargled Old Testament language, and he just opened it up because out of haste. That's what they tell you. All historians say it. Or they don't report it at all because it's just insignificant. Guess what Bible reference was opened on that historic day. George Washington opened up Genesis 49 and placed his hands over the promise of Jacob that Jacob made to Joseph about a land. What's significant about this is nobody knew about this until Joseph, until George, until, uh, Joseph Smith came along, came along to explain who Ephraim was in this whole thing and how it was all connected. You're not going to find any theologian then or today talking about Genesis 49 as America. The restoration of the gospel, the light of that movement was what brought that knowledge. And yet George Washington opened to that scripture? Doctrine and Covenants 101 tells us that the Constitution of the United States was brought forth by him. Holy principles, he calls them. And he brought them to light. Like I said before, if I had time to get into it, you'd see the Constitution is just just a, a written format for the American Covenant. Alma 26 Remember, this covenant is a repeat of the Book of Mormon account. Alma 26, Captain Moroni brings his people. He's not a prophet. He's a national leader. He raises the standard of liberty. We're we're in national covenant territory now, not priesthood covenant, national covenant. The people come. He raises the standard. It's a constitutional promise, similar to our constitution. Okay? And he rallies the people under under his American covenant. Do you know that he referenced? Go read the account in Alma 26, 46. He referenced the blessings of Jacob to Joseph. He says, remember, we get the blessings from Jacob. They're ours. And they're embodied in this standard. He invoked that blessing from Genesis 49. Absolutely fascinating. So when we put that together with Ephraim's turn, and we see a similar general under a similar situation doing the exact same thing, invoking the American covenant in modern times, and then referencing back to Jacob's promise to Joseph, This is profound. There's so many miracles that accompany this revolutionary period. I wish I could get into all of them. But one that I want to talk about is these two people right here, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were were the most important people Washington accepted in the revolutionary movement. As far as the Declaration of Independence goes, they were the two most important, for sure. Washington wasn't even there. He was already fighting the British at that point. They call him the voice of independence because he was the one who made the speeches that brought the, co- the, the conversion to the American covenant. And, of course, he's the pen, Thomas Jefferson. He wrote it. And they worked together. It's, it's significant, you understand. They are, the, they are the two most significant players in the Declaration of Independence. Um, they also have a very colored hist- colorful history together. Uh, best of friends during the revolutionary cause. They lived together. Their families lived together in France as they were diplomats. Very good friends. Uh, family. They, they considered each other family. They were that close. 
But then when they go back to America, a newly independent America, under the Constitution, they have a fierce disagreement about the direction the country should take, and they become bitter enemies. And one of the most vitriolic, mudslinging elections ever in our history was the election of 1800 between these two guys. And they became bitter, bitter enemies. They wouldn't even talk to each other. At the end of their lives, the revolution done, they're old men about to die, they become best friends again. And they write a series of letters to each other. Washington, or Adams from his home in Boston, outside of Boston, and, and, and uh, Jefferson from his home in Monticello in Virginia. And they write these letters, and what do they talk about? They talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They talk about the recognition that they're living under an apostasy, but that's going to break pretty soon. They talk about uh, the disgraceful doctrines of the day, about how man, uh, if, if, if not able to access Jesus Christ, will die and go to hell forever. Even if they live in some far, far away place where they never get the chance, it doesn't matter, you're going to hell. How despicable that was, they said. Or the, the doctrine that man is... That, that, uh, Man is saved by grace alone, no, no, no matter what you do in this life. They said that was despicable. Jefferson said the man who came up with that idea is an atheist, in my, in my mind. Um, they recognized truths that Joseph, or, or problems that Joseph Smith would come and, and, and help with eventually. And they, I believe that they knew that they were on that road. I believe it because uh, for the simple fact that they said it. 1820. Thomas Jefferson said this. 1820 is a significant year. 1820, Joseph Smith receives his first vision. These guys are still alive. To give you some kind of reference here, George Washington, don't read this yet. You're, you're stealing my thunder. Okay. <laughs> George Washington uh, could have been Joseph Smith's grandfather, to put it in perspective so you can see the generation gap. That's how close we're talking here in time. Okay. In fact, George, Joseph Smith's grandfather fought under Washington. Okay. Now, 1820, these guys are old now, they're dying, and they're starting to get a vision of what this is all about. Thomas Jefferson, not the first time he said this, by the way. I hold the precepts of Jesus as delivered by himself to be the most pure, benevolent, and sublime which have ever been preached to man. I adhere to the principles of the first age and consider all subsequent innovations as corruptions of this religion, having no foundation in what came from him. He knew he was in an apostasy. If the freedom of religion guaranteed to us by law and theory, re referring to the Constitution, which at that point was really theoretical, can ever rise in practice under the overbearing Inquisition, in other words, if we can live the American covenant here, okay, then truth will prevail and the genuine doctrines of Jesus, so long perverted by his pseudo-priests, will again be restored to their original purity. This reformation will advance with other improvements of the human mind, but too late for me to witness. He said this at least two or three times. Actually, three times that we know he said this at the end of his life. Six years after he said this, he died. Four years after he died, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was established. This is significant. This is them working on the Declaration together with Ben Franklin. Those were the three in the committee. This is the home that Adams died in, from which he wrote these letters back and forth with Jefferson. Um, something happened. Significant here. Um, we read of signs and, and, and signs from God in the, in, in the Book of Mormon era and signs that were a seal of approval of God. This was one of them. These two revolutionaries, writing these letters back and forth, they're, they're the last two really surviving. James Madison was still alive, but he wasn't part of the Declaration of Independence. He was, he was too young for that. Most of them, these guys have outlived almost all of them. They're the last two, and they're the most prominent, like I said before. They were the two, they were the voice and pen of independence. And they're alive and they're about to die, and they die together on the same day. Now, they die of unrelated causes four or five states apart from each other, but they die on the same day. And that might just be a curiosity until you, can, until you consider the fact that the day they died on was July 4th, 1826. They died on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence of unrelated causes. Jefferson died at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, about four or five hours later, with family around him in this home right here, John Adams stirred in his sleep. He looked up and he said, Thomas Jefferson survives. Then he closes his eyes and dies. And again, historians say, what in the world was that comment or your deathbed comment? That was weird. What was Brigham Young's deathbed comment? Joseph, Joseph, Joseph. What happened here? I can just, I can just guess, but I think I know. 
Okay? I think Thomas Jefferson picked them up. And guess, and, and the thing that's sad is this generation of Americans understood this to be a miracle of God. They understood that God was saying, this is a stamp of approval on this American cause, on this American covenant. And he was eulogized. It was, they were both eulogized under this context, that this was God. And yet, we don't even talk about it today. It's been taken out of our history books. Now, one of the most stunning parts of this is at the end of their lives, um, when they're still alive writing these letters, John Adams' best friend dies. His best friend, his partner, his companion is Abigail. John Adams, was, he was a tough guy to like. But, at, but he, the only person he had sometimes in his whole career was, was his wife, Abigail. And she always stood by his side. When she died, they were old, and it was just this, this tragic event for him. As she died, he walked out of his room sobbing, saying, I wish I could just crawl into bed and die next to her. And, and he, he was just devastated. Jefferson finds out about it and writes to him and says, John, don't worry. Don't you know that you'll be together forever? Eternal marriage is a real principle. And John Adams writes back and says, I know it's real. I can't read it anywhere. I can't find it anywhere, but I know it's real. And I believe that too. Because Jefferson lost his wife early in his life as well, his wife Martha. Well, the miracle continues because we know that in August of 1877, Jefferson, along with his wife Martha, and Adams, along with Abigail and their families, and George Washington, along with his wife Martha and his children, or his stepchildren, and his step-grandchildren, and an abundance of other people, showed up to Saint, at the St. George Temple and appeared to, to, to uh, Wilfred Woodruff and had their, their covenants done, had their work done for them. And the other people that are involved in the American covenant that showed up here, I don't have time to get into them, they all showed up, men and women alike. More women than men, in fact, showed up. Okay? Under, another underreported part of our history. Now, I don't have time or really an inclination to get too much into this part of the book. There's a chapter entitled Ancient Orders, Founding Fathers in the Temple of God. These were special people that understood something. And we, I fear, I believe, for, have too, for, for too long, we have run from the fact that Joseph Smith and, and almost all the apostles in that first generation were Masons. Ooh, they were Masons. Let's not talk about it. Let's run from it. Let's pretend that it's not, it means nothing, Okay. But when you look at the evidence, it had to mean something. I don't have time to get into it all. But instead of running from it, with the American covenant, with the understanding of the American covenant, and what the founder's part in this whole thing was, we can understand that masonry is nothing but a representation of ancient orders that go back to Adam. Okay? And I get into it in my book. You might, you're not going to believe me right now. You're going to think, oh, crazy, quack, ballad, whatever. Read just, just I promise you. Read it. Okay? And then you can embrace this idea that Joseph Smith like George Washington before him, was a master mason, and there was a reason for it. And I'm not going to get into it. These are things better read in the privacy of your own home, but you're going to recognize a lot of things in here. These are this, there's a reason George Washington was attracted to Masonic symbols like the compass and square and implanted them into the architecture. He designed it. This is Washington, D.C. There's a reason that he did stuff like this. These aren't Mormon pictures. These are pictures of, of, of Washington. There's a reason that there's a... Now this, one of the greatest American covenant moments in history was that George Washington gave up power. He gave up power like no revolutionary hero ever in the history of the world had done. But he, he, he said, here, I brought, you, I brought you guys safely into port. I'm going back to my farm. And, and here's a representation of that. He gives the sword back. One of the greatest American covenant moments. There is a reason that he, in this depiction, has his arm to the square, has a, has a robe on his right shoulder. There's a reason that Columbus is depicted here, Ephraim. And, and on the other side of him over here, right on this picture, is Manasseh as a Native American. Okay. These are symbolisms. Again, like, I don't have time to get into them all. Here's, here's Ben Franklin, another person I stood. There's a reason that you stand in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol and look up, and there's a depiction of George Washington receiving his exaltation. This is the apotheosis of Washington. That's the title. Apo meaning to become, and theos meaning God. And then below this are, Im are, are imagery of the American covenant. Below this is Nephi's vision, these great oil on canvas murals, pictures of uh, Nephi's vision. Everything he saw in his vision, you stand in the rotunda and just go in a circle, and it's supporting symbolically this gospel principle. I wish I had more time to go into this. There's a reason that our United States seal has this, this eagle goes back into Book of Mormon imagery. There's, and this this, the, the, the reverse side is a representation of temple worship. And you have to read it to find that out. 
I got to move through here. The Washington Monument, which is on top, depicts that pyramid. That was significant. The architects clearly wanted the pyramid up there. Do you know that on the east side of this, facing ever symbolic to the east, it says Laos Dale, which means praise be to God. Did you know that inscribed in here, it says holiness to the Lord? Or that there's, there's compasses and squares embedded throughout this monument. This is a Bible buried in the cornerstone. There's reasons for all this. These people understood things that we don't give them credit for understanding. The plot thickens. The plot thickens. Here's, here's really, as much as I love this other American covenant stuff, this is my favorite part. Because the American covenant goes immediately into breach. After this glorious revolution, it goes immediately into breach. How is it breached? It's breached because we practice this evil thing called slavery. And Benjamin Rush, one of the great founders, one of the great revolutionaries, he said, the gospel of Jesus Christ will never exist in America as long as slavery is here. It will not. Another breach of the covenant is that God's people who are here trying to build the kingdom are being beaten, raped, kicked out, burned out, killed, imprisoned. It's the story of, 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 of Joseph Smith and his, and his people, Right? The covenant was in breach. And poor Joseph, read, read the accounts. He's saying, what on earth is going on? He, he loved the Constitution, loved the Constitution. And he said, why? And he understood the American covenant. Why is the covenant not working, he says. He, he pleads with the Lord. Why is it not working? It's supposed to be working, and yet look what's happening. I can't, we can't do anything. We can't build our temples. They burn them down. They steal them from us. What is going on? Where's the American covenant that's supposed to protect us? And that is the context in which we read Doctrine and Covenants 101. The context, where we always like to read that one verse where it says, God sent us the Constitution, and he brought it forth by inspired men, and so on and so forth. Well, that was in response to Joseph's plea to the Lord. It was in 1833, and he said, why are we being harassed like this? And the Lord said, Joseph, I gave you the Constitution, I gave you the covenant. You know, look what I did. I, I did my part. Now you got to do your part. And he tells him. And this is in Doctrine and Covenants 101. Right after... God says he established the Constitution. He tells, he says, Joseph, you and your people need to do the following. You need to importune at the feet of the judge. And if he heeds you not, then importune at the feet of the governor. And if the governor heeds you not, importune at the feet of the president. Did Joseph do that? Almost immediately. He had tried everything. He went to, he went to the federal level. He went to the state level and to the federal level. He said, you guys need to enforce the Constitution. You are the custodians, especially the federal government. He hit them hard. You created this constitution. You are the custodians of the Bill of Rights. You need to bring people into Missouri and stop the madness and, and allow us to enjoy the blessings of the American covenant, the blessings of the constitution. And what did the federal government say to him? Do you know, do you know how they interpreted the constitution back in those days? Did you know that the federal government said what, what Missouri was doing to the states, including extermination orders, was totally legal? It's states' rights. They can do what they want to do. They can do what they want to do. The federal government's, their, their, their interpretation of the Constitution, and it was wrong. James Madison, who wrote it, actually told them that they would, they, that, that not to do this, and they did it. They said that the Bill of Rights only restricts us as a federal government. We can't do that thing to you. But if the state of Missouri wants to do it to you, that's their business. We're two different governments. We're not going to insert ourselves. Okay? And Joseph was pleading with them, please insert yourself. Please bring someone over here. But that's how it was. You didn't, have, you didn't have your Bill of Rights. Unless your state decided to agree with the Constitution and they could choose whether to agree with it or not, you didn't have it. Did you know this? It wasn't until the 14th Amendment came along that said, from here, on, from here on forth, no state in the Union can decide whether or not they're going to apply the Bill of Rights. And if you decide not to, we will, the federal government will come in and make you. This was significant. This is what saved the church. If, if we could ever get to this point. And Joseph sought it. He sought it so much so that in 1844, he ran for the president of the United States to get the loudest voice he could get. And what was his platform? His platform was the ideas put forth in the 14th Amendment. That the federal government needs to be more active. Now, I know some of you think, well, federal government maybe has gone too far today. Yes, it has. But we're not talking about today. We're talking about back in the days when they were doing nothing. Okay. And he said, they need to get, get going, and if, if I become president, I will make sure that the Bill of Rights are enforced upon the states. He said that. And the other thing he said was, as part of his political platform, you've got to stop doing this. Slavery thing, what are you doing? 
We have to emancipate the slaves. And then he made a warning. He said, if you don't do this, God will come upon you, and it's going to be hell on wheels for America. He's going to make you do this if you don't do it. Well, he won't make you, of course, but he'll influence you to the point where you will do it. Okay? And he told them time and again. He wrote letters to Congress. He said, this government's going to fall apart. You have to do what I'm saying. And why did he say that? Because remember that scripture I just read to you? Let them importune to the feet of the judge. Let them importune to the feet of the governor. And then go to the president. And here's the, here's the key part. And God says, And if the president heed them not, then will the Lord arise and come forth out of his hiding place. And in his fury vex the nation. And in his hot displeasure and in his fierce anger in his time will cut off those wicked. What I have said unto you must needs be, this is DNC 101, that all men may be left without excuse, that I may proceed to bring to pass my act, my strange act, and perform my work, my strange work. What is my strange work and my strange act? Cross-reference that. It's the restored gospel of, of Jesus Christ. Listen to this prophet. Do what he's saying to do. Apply the American covenant or else I will apply it. That's what God is saying. And he says this also, he says, he says in verse 92, Pray ye therefore that their ears may be opened unto their, your cries, that I may be merciful unto them, that these things may not come upon them. He didn't want it to happen. Well, did they listen to Joseph? Did they listen to him at all? Joseph said, I wish so badly, I have the quote, I wish so badly that I could bring the American people out of, in, in unto repentance, but they're not going to listen to me. Joseph was a prophet of the American covenant, no doubt. And like I said, what he sought was the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment got rid of slavery. Well, the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment established the rights of all people, including slaves, and it would have solved the church's problems because it would have said, you states now must enforce the Bill of Rights. You cannot choose not to and exterminate a whole group of people. That's what the 14th Amendment said. Joseph sought for it. He ran for president on it. And the response by the nation was killing him and burning the temple. The point of no return had come. This prophecy must be fulfilled. Part of the prophecy, it's all, not only did Joseph Smith, well, I'll get to that in a minute. But part of the prophecy, which becomes highly significant, is, this is a little bit later in 1839, and, and Joseph's asking the same question to God. Why is this happening to us? And he says, God says, don't worry. The enemies of the church, quote, shall melt away as the hoarfrost melted before the burning rays of the, of the sun. Those who swear falsely against my servants, he's talking about this generation, the generation that swears falsely against Joseph, they will be brought into bondage and death. Their baskets shall not be full. Their houses and their barns shall perish. The prophecies by necessity had to be fulfilled. So God picked up his saints, took them out of the United States, and dropped them in Mexico. This was Mexico at the time, right? Dropped them out of the United States and unleashed hell on the nation. That's what happened. Until he got the result he wanted. And what was the result? The 14th Amendment. And what was the vexation? The Civil War. The Civil War humbled the nation, just like God humbled the nation of the Hebrews, just like he humbled the nations of the Nephites. And the fruit of that humbling was the 14th Amendment. It was the very thing Joseph said, do it now or God will make you do it and it won't be pleasant. And then comes Abraham Lincoln, one of the greatest American covenant makers ever in our history. When he showed up on the scene, this gentle man who shouldn't have even been there, who, how he got elected, no one really knows because he served two years of, two, two term, two, one term of Congress, besides that, basically, basically just a lawyer, state legislator, a little bit. Um, basically a no-namer. Um, shows up, becomes the president, and um, when the war broke out, he, did not, he was not converted to Joseph's vision. In fact, when he launched the attacks against the South, it was just to bring them back. But he, didn't, he wasn't about changing the Constitution. He didn't want a 14th Amendment. He didn't want to free the slaves. That was not his intent. He told the South in his first inaugural address, just come back. Everything can be the same. He needed the vision, and so as part of that process, he needed to be humble too, along with the entire nation. They needed to get the, the, the vision that Joseph had about the American covenant. And he did get that. Within the, in the first year of war, the North was supposed to win. They had, they, had, they had everything. They outnumbered the South in every way. Okay, The South was no wilting flower, Okay, but the North had the production, the numbers, and so forth. So everyone thought it was pretty quick. And it wasn't. In fact, the North kept losing again and again. And, and, and 
Abraham Lincoln went through a conversion to the American covenant. He called it a process of crystallization. He, said, he, started, he started acting kind of bizarre to some people. He started disappearing, and like, they'd find him reading the scriptures in his, in his bedroom or in a closet on a, steam sh- on a steamboat one time. Um, he started talking about God all the time, and he started saying, God wants us to happen. We're both wrong. Both sides are wrong here. We don't understand what this is about. This is about God doing something to this nation. He got this message. It was absolutely astounding. And when he came out of it, he said, this is a process of crystallization I've gone through. Part of his humbling process included this awful event, right? And that during that first year of war, when his, little son, his 12-year-old son, Willie, dies, his best little friend, Willie. And it's just, just heart-wrenching to see him. Uh, his, his secretary's talking about how he walked into his office after Willie had finally died of typhoid fever, and he just put his just big, gangly body, just kind of collapsed on the floor and just fell apart. He would, he would hide himself away every Thursday. That's the day Willie died and for, for months, and he would just cry. They'd hear him just weeping. And, and this on top of this war that he's presiding over, this gentle man who couldn't even hunt. He hated death so much he wouldn't even see animals die. Okay, and he's presiding over this war, and he knows that God's telling him to. Because he said it. He said that God is telling me this has got to go forward. This is a humbling process for the nation. And he caught the vision. Now, the first step in this vision was free the slaves. So, um, this is this year of contemplation. And there, another very fascinating element during this conversion process happens. Um, in, in, in the fall of 1861 is when it really began. He really started saying, oh my goodness, this is not what we think it is. God is behind this. He checked out a book at the, at the Library of Congress. He had that book for eight months exactly. Now, to preface this, Joseph, or, uh, um, Abraham Lincoln's first indication that he had been converted to a new cause is when he put together the Emancipation Proclamation and laid it on the table of his cabinet and said, the war is about this now. And everyone said, are you crazy? The war is not about this. We want the South to come back with slavery, with the Constitution as it was. But we know that God knew that the Constitution was not, it wasn't being interpreted correctly. A new system needed to be added to it because they, weren't, they, they didn't listen to the wisdom of the founders. Um, and so he, took us, he checks this book out. He has this book for eight months. Okay? He, tur- he turns that book back in, and then seven days later is when he issued the Emancipation Proclamation to his cabinet for the first time. Seven days later. So the timing of this book is significant. Also significant about this book is it's the one book that existed on the earth at this time that, like no other book, explained the American covenant about a nation being righteous and, be- and being, uh, you know, having to deal with scourges and vexations of God if, they don't be right- if they're not righteous, specifically about the American covenant. The book that he had during that time period was the Book of Mormon. They said, I'm not making this up. I've seen the records. He signed for them himself. And, and Abraham Lincoln was probably our most avid reader. He didn't check books out to not read them. I can guarantee you that. And especially when he happened for eight months. And then the, the fact that he had that, the eight-month period in which he had that book was his self-proclaimed process of crystallization, where he's constantly reading the Bible, okay? That's what they saw. It looks like he's reading the Bible, okay? I'm sure he was reading the Bible, too. Um, second inaugural address if you go to Lincoln Memorial go stand up there and turn to your right and read it it's on, it's on the wall what is it? it's a page out of the Book of Mormon he sits there and says the whole nation north and south has been under condemnation for ill behavior and we need a new vision a new light he was catching Joseph Smith's vision for the American Covenant while he gave this inaugural address like Washington before him, he opened the scriptures up to something, to a place significant. He opened up to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5 talks about a nation that's being, it's under a scourge and vexation of God, and they're being humbled, and so on and so forth. That, and, and that was, his speech reflected that language. When he bent down to kiss the Bible after he was sworn in, this is his second swearing in, this is about a couple months before he was assassinated. He, he reached down and he, and he, and he kissed, according to Salmon Chase, who administered the oath, he said he, he intentionally kissed 25 and 26. Now, here's, here's what's significant about Isaiah 5. If we, in our Sunday school manuals, if we read Isaiah 5, we know that Isaiah is talking about Latter-day America. Isaiah is talking about the restoration of the gospel. He's talking, and this is this, what we talks about. Uh, he sees in vision, he tries to describe trains and planes, and the, the, you know, missionaries will go forth, and they won't have to lash their shoes in a day. You, you've all heard this, these prophecies where he's seeing the restoration of the gospel. But preceding those verses in Isaiah 5, there's going to be a scourge and vexation. Isaiah saw Latter-day America in the Restoration. We know this. How many times did he talk about it? 
He, he, he prophesied of these things. So the Abraham Lincoln knew this, that he seemed to be, he seemed to know this. It was astounding. What's more astounding is that guess what the Book of Mormon does? The Book of Mormon cites Isaiah 5 and puts it in the context of Latter-day America. So if Abraham Lincoln's reading the Book of Mormon, he's going to come across Isaiah, who's quoted by Nephi, and he's going to say, oh my goodness, he's talking about us. He's talking about Latter-day America. He would have known that. So this becomes very significant. And here's what, I, here's, what the, here's what the prophecy says. Because they have cast away the law of the Lord, the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel, therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he has stretched forth his hand against them and has smitten them. And the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is outstretched still. And he will lift, here's the fruit of this, and he will lift up an ensign to the nations from afar, and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth, and behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. The Grand Richards and others have said, this ensign is the restoration of the gospel. Elder Holland said it at this past conference. The ensign they're talking about is the restoration of the gospel. That was the fruit of this vexation. Lincoln opens up and, and uses this as his inspiration. He knew things. And so with that vision, he walks in, like I said, lays down the Emancipation Proclamation, and everybody in the cabinet says, what are you doing? You're going to ruin this cause, except for this guy right here, William Seward, very significant player. William Seward was his supporter. When, when no one else could, when Lincoln, Lincoln had no friends during this time. He had very few friends. People turned on him all the time. He was coming up with these new ideas, this new vision. Um, his wife didn't even like him that much a lot of times. So he spent a lot of time at William Seward's home. He became his elder brother. William Seward, by the way, was supposed to win the election. He was, he was the prominent player. He was the governor, the senator, and no one could believe that Lincoln outsmarted him, you know, beat him in the, in the primaries, the Republican primaries. But then Lincoln does the humble thing and asks him immediately, will you be my secretary of state? And they become best friends. William Seward, unsung hero of this cause. If, if this, it's kind of like a Joseph Hiram situation here. This is the unsung hero, the constant support who gets none of the credit, okay? And, uh, and without Seward, Lincoln would have been in trouble. The good news is, even though these two guys had the vision, the rest of the cabinet didn't really get it, but the rest of the, the whole union was being humbled. And you can read their letters, their studies that have been done recently about the true intent of the South and the North. And it all falls in the line of what we're saying here. There was a humbling that went through these people, just like the ancient Hebrews, just like the ancient Nephites, the same story being played out again. They were humbled, and they caught the vision of the 14th Amendment, and they started fighting for that. They caught Joseph's vision. Okay? They now began to fight for a new vision, a new policy that would emancipate slaves, change the Constitution, give us the 14th Amendment, not change it, okay? Because like I said, the Constitution was okay. They're misinterpreting it, but shore it up, okay? And give us the 14th Amendment, which would save the kingdom of God. Once they caught that vision, then the North starts winning. The covenant is reactivated, and the blessings of protection start hitting them, and they start winning. What of the South? I talk a lot about the South. I'm not going to get into it today, um, but except to say one thing. Um, the South had a form of government that beat up on the saints, that beat up on blacks. It was an oppressive form of government. It was not good government. They changed their constitution from we the people to we the sovereigns of the states. Okay? They, uh, they were not, it was not a good government. Okay? They wanted to keep it as it was or worse, and as, as illustrated by what happened to the saints under that government. Now, the hotbed of rebellion in the South was in a certain area. Can you guess which state? Remember that prophecy I told you about where it said that their houses and their barns shall burn, the enemies of the church, right? So we should, we should see, who, well, who were the enemies of the church? Who were swearing falsely and killing and beating up our people? And God says that they, their houses and barns shall burn. Did you know if you picked one state in the union that took the most abuse during the Civil War? It was Missouri, hands down. Historical consensus on that. Because the war actually started before 1861, okay, um, in, in Missouri. And it was a hot, but the adversary had a, had a grip on that part of the world, on that part of the, of the nation. For reasons we know. He knew that we were trying to build Zion there. So he set up his camps. The Union recognized those camps that the adversary had set up. And they got so sick and tired of this hotbed of rebellion and what they were doing, that there was Union Order Number 11 in, in, in the latter part of 1863. They went into Missouri, and they said, all of you, 
out, and they leveled the town. They leveled the county. And guess what county it was they picked? Jackson County. Leveled it. Their, their houses and their barns perished. And then Lincoln said, okay, let them come back. They bring them back in and say, you can come back and take these lands again. Your, your houses and barns are perished. But you can take the land again if you make a covenant. If you take an oath of this vision that we had with the North of what America is to be. And I love this because I hope, I hope that some of them at least realize. So Joseph Smith asked us to do this about 30 years ago. And he told us that if we didn't do it right now, that God would make us do it. And here they are, God making them do it. They, they signed on to what Joseph told them to do 30 years ago, and now they did it the hard way because they didn't listen to him. Okay. The two heroes of the cause who got that vision early on. Did you know that when Lincoln was assassinated, again, back to this Hiram and Joseph analogy, when Lincoln was assassinated, did you know that Lewis Powell, Booth's accomplice, tried to kill Seward as well? But he, he escaped death. Uh, he had been in an in a, in a accident. He had been in, an, in, a, in a, a carriage accident, which placed a, a metal uh, uh, bar around his neck. And that's what, that's what saved his life. Um, so he had been convalescing at the end of the war. The war just ended. This is when he goes to Fort Theater. The war was over. The North had won. Um, he's in his bed, dying, almost dying. Uh, Seward is from this carriage accident. But when Lewis Powell comes in with his bowie knife, starts stabbing at him, he can't get a good shot into his neck, but he almost kills him. Um, Lincoln, of course, dies. And then there's this, this, this sweet, sad scene where um, Seward is laying in his bed. This, this second attack compounded by the first element he already had. And he starts, his eyes start filling up with tears several days after this happened. And he turns to his attendant and he says, my best friend, Abraham Lincoln, in debt. And they said, no, 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 he's not dead. Because the doctor said, don't tell him Lincoln is, that, is dead because he, he won't survive. And he says, I know he is dead because there is no way. Death is the only thing that would keep Lincoln from being at my bedside after this attack on my life. And um, the, the attendant said, okay, he's, he's dead. And I believe he was probably thinking that the last reunion they had had is right when the war ended. Lincoln had just come from Richmond, Virginia, the, the southern the Confederacy's um, a capital. And the first person he wanted to go tell about what happened in Richmond, the, the slaves jumping around, for, they're free, they're free, um, bowing to Lincoln. Lincoln says, don't bow to me, bow to God. He did this. Lincoln told that to them. And he went to, to his bedside, to Seward's bedside after his carriage accident and told them all about it. And Seward is elated, laying there, you know, all casted up. And, and Seward's son was in the room and he talked about how Lincoln laid out along his, 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 his bed and put his, you know, propped his hand up like, you know, his head up like this and laid out and just told Seward all these things, that these wonderful things that happened and, until Seward drifted off to sleep. That was the last time that they saw each other in mortality. And then, of course, Lincoln dies. But it has a happy ending. And the happy ending is, guess who was also in the St. George Temple with the founders? Abraham Lincoln was there. And at his side, according to the records of Wilfred Woodruff, was William Seward. They were both there. Even though nobody, how many of us even knew who William Seward was before today? <laughs> okay, he was there. These are American covenant makers. And what of the Union soldiers? They went through a similar process. They were American covenant makers. They knew what they were fighting for. I want to make this very clear. Before the Civil War, temples of God burned to the ground. Before the Civil War, prophets of God were assassinated. After the Civil War, temples maintained a healthy environment where people could go and, and, make, and make covenants. This is significant, okay? And these guys caught this vision. Sullivan Ballou, about my age, he's a sergeant in, in, the, in, the, in the union. He wrote a letter to his wife days before he was killed in battle. He knew he was going to die. He knew he was putting his life on the line. And, he was, and here's the letter he wrote. And you tell me if he didn't understand the American covenant. It's sometimes hard for me to get through because he had little kids about my age, and it's just, my very dear Sarah, the indications are very strong that we shall move in a few days, perhaps tomorrow. Lest I should not be, a bit, be able to write again, I feel impelled to write a few lines that may fall under your eye when I shall be no more. Not my will, but thine, O oh God, be done. If it is necessary that I should fall on the battlefield for my country, I am ready. 
I have no misgivings about or lack of confidence in the cause in which I am engaged, and my courage does not halt or falter. I know how strongly American civilization now leans on the triumph of the government and how great a debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and sufferings of the revolution. And I am willing, perfectly willing, to lay down my joys in this life to help maintain this government. And I cannot describe to, I cannot describe to you my feelings on this calm summer Sabbath night when 2,000 men are sleeping around me, many of them enjoying perhaps the last sleep before that of death. Well, I am suspicious that death is creeping around me with his fatal darts as I sit communing with God, my country, and thee. I have sought most closely and diligently and often in my heart for a wrong motive in thus hazarding the happiness of those I love, and I could find none. A pure love of my country and of the principles I had so often advocated before the people, another name of honor that I love more than I fear death, has called upon me, and I have obeyed. Sarah, my love for you is deathless. It seems to bind me with mighty cables that nothing but omnipotence could break. And yet my love of country comes over me like a strong wind and, burn, and burns me unresistibly on with all these chains to the battlefield. If I do not return to you, my dear Sarah, never forget how much I love you. And when my last breath escapes me on the battlefield, it will, be, it will whisper your name. But, oh, Sarah, if the dead can come back to this earth and flit unseen around those they love, I shall always be near you in the gladdest days and in the darkest nights. Advise to your happiest scenes and gloomiest hours, always, always. And if there be a soft breeze upon your cheek, it shall be my breath, as the cool air fans your throbbing temple. It shall be my spirit passing by. Sarah, do not mourn me dead. Think I am gone and wait for thee, for we shall meet again. As for my little boys, they will never grow up. They will grow up and never know my father's love and care. Little Willie is too young to remember me long, and my blue-eyed Edgar will keep my frolics with him among the dim memories of childhood. Sarah, I have unlimited confidence in your master and your maternal care and your development of their characters and feel that God will bless you in your holy work. Oh, Sarah, I wait for you there. Come to me and lead thither my children. He understood what he was fighting for. He understood the hope of being reunited with his family, and he was. His work has been done, okay? Because what he was fighting for was temples of God, to be able to exist under the American covenant, something that wasn't happening before that war, before the vexation. To conclude, I want to talk about this prophetess of the American covenant, Julia Ward Howe. Julia Ward Howe Julia Ward Howe visited a Union camp in 1863, and she went to bed that night, woke up in the middle of the night, without any light, scribbled these lines down. She said it was a revelation given to her about the, the purpose of this war. Those lyrics end up becoming the hymn that we, read, that we sing today in our church congregations, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. But some of the original lyrics have been changed. Do you tell me she didn't understand this vision that Joseph Smith had, that Abraham Lincoln had, that Solomon Ballou had, that the nation had learned to have? When, he, when she says things like, he hath loosed the fateful lightning, the fateful lightnings of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. What truth are we talking about here? They have builded him an altar, she says, in the evening dews and damps. Our God is marching on. I have read a burning gospel written fiery rows of steel. As ye deal with my contemners, so with you my grace shall deal. Let the hero born of woman crush the serpent with his heel. Think what we're talking about here. This war was nothing but a reiteration of the war in heaven here in America. That's what it was. He has waked the earth's dull sorrow, she says. Be swift my soul to answer him, she says. And in this part, as he died, and so when she talks about the Savior, the, part, the, the most poignant verse probably, and when the advent of Jesus Christ, and she, she says, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. Now, we sing it today, let us live to make them free. They changed that. But Solomon Balloon knew. The Union sang to this song. They, they marched to this song. Let us die to make men free. They knew what this was about. He is coming like the glory of the morning of the wave. And then the, the, the refrain, the, 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 the chorus. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. This is the truth of the gospel. They knew it. They were fighting for it. Now, I'm done with my part of the presentation. Um... The book goes on, because this, this covenant still, it, we're still fighting it today. I, I don't have time to get into it. 
Somebody told me last time, it didn't end with the Civil War, Ballard. I said, I know, but I, 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 I got to leave you something to read, right? It continues on to the present day, okay? But it's so much embodied here in the Civil War, in the Revolutionary War. This is our covenant. And it's our responsibility as a nation to continue to perpetuate this covenant because we could, we could lose it still. To conclude, I want to, um, I'm going to show you a presentation. Now, my best friend is here today. Both my best friends are here today, both my brothers. Um, one of them uh, wrote a song for me based on this book. Um, and Todd, where are you? He's going to kill me. He's in the very back. Wrote this song, sang this song. He's, he's singing this song. It's based on this, on my book that he read and edited to death. Awesome. Okay? He was the refining fire of my book, no question. But he wrote this song, and I, want, I, I know you're going to catch the vision of what he's trying to say. And I'm going to conclude with this. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword, and his truth is marching on.
Thank you very much for your time.